I'm going to start in Philippians 3 and verse 13 and talk about some things to look forward to. Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. This is a good verse to prove we shouldn't dwell on things of the past, even past sins. We need to forget those things that are behind us. I'm ashamed of the wicked things I did as a lost person, and also wicked things I have done even after salvation. I should forget those things and reach forth unto those things which are before. And here are some reasons why. Number one, we should look forward to the prize. We have a prize to look forward to. At the judgment seat of Christ, we will get rewards, crowns, precious stones, gold, millennial inheritance. This is something to look forward to if you are living for Jesus Christ. Philippians 3.14 says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul is pressing toward the mark for the prize. Many people are breaking the command to redeem the time. They are spending their time playing Xbox games and unlocking achievements on a video game system. People care more about winning prizes on an arcade game than getting an eternal prize. 1 Corinthians 3.12 talks about us getting gold, silver, and precious stones at the judgment seat. That is, if we serve God and suffer for Him on earth. And to do that, we have to redeem the time. The Bible will compare the Christian life to sports at times. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We should be doing things to obtain an incorruptible crown. We want to receive this prize. If our Christian lives are spent on doing things for the flesh and serving ourselves, then we aren't setting up treasure in heaven. If we spend all of our time on watching sports on TV, then we're not really running the race very well. Matthew 6.20 says, But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Hebrews 12.1 Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice it says run with patience. Patience is key in the Christian life. And 1 Corinthians 9, 26 and 27 says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So there are fights in the Christian life. We are in a constant battle with our flesh, and we need to bring it into subjection. Philippians 3, 15 let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall e reveal even this unto you. The one who believes the race is over is the one who is otherwise minded. And this pro verse proves that God will reveal things to people. If you have scripture that you don't understand, then ask God to reveal to you the meaning. God reveals things to people. If you don't understand a verse, pray about it and ask for revelation on that verse. Many times in prayer, I ask God for wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and revelation of the scriptures. God will reveal to us the error of our ways when we read the Bible and stay in contact with Him through prayer. This brings me to the next point, which is another thing we should be looking forward to is one day we are going to have many things revealed to us. Look at Romans 8.18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. God will reveal things to us while we are here on earth, but it would be awesome to see what He reveals to us when we are actually with Him. I want to see the Bible played out on a big HD screen and have Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul teach me verse by verse. Uh, Philippians 3.16 says, Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. 
So when it comes to the areas we have already attained, we should stay walking by those things and keeping those things in our mind. If you have become a King James Bible believer, then you should stay a Bible believer. If God has revealed to you that salvation is by grace through faith without works, then stick to that. Don't be tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. You don't want to lose any ground or go backwards. The best way not to go backwards is to not give any place to the devil, as it says in Ephesians 4.27. Stick with what you have attained and stay reaching forward and pressing toward the mark. If you are going to stay pressing forward, make sure the person you follow and the people you associate with are also reaching forward. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. The Philippians didn't have to worry about uh, who they were following when it came to Paul. They knew they could be a follower of him because he was pressing toward the mark. It is okay to follow a man who has the King James Bible as his final authority. Many will say they only follow Jesus Christ, but Jesus Christ also gave us pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so on and so forth for us to follow as well. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. So it's okay to follow a man if he's following Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So if a man's following God... You're, fo you're following God by following Him. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. A good man to follow is a man that lets you know he isn't perfect, and that it is the Bible which is perfect in the final authority. He will point you in the direction of Jesus Christ and the Bible. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as you have us for an ensample. An ensample is better than an example, because it is the actual thing, and not only like the thing. The example is like the thing, the ensample is the actual thing. And another reason to look forward is because we will soon be in a place without enemies of the cross. We're going to be in a place that doesn't have false prophets and false teachers and people that are enemies and evil men who are waxing worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. If you look at Philippians 3, 18 and 19, it says, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose endage is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Notice verse 18 said, For many walk. These men definitely don't walk with the Lord. Their way of life is serving themselves. When it comes to literal walking, they are walking with the devil. And 1 Peter 5, 8 says, He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Walking about seeking whom he may devour. And they're walking with him doing the same thing. These men, and Philipp, talked about in Philippians 3, were such enemies of the cross that they brought Paul to a state of weeping. He is sick of false prophets, blaspheming Jesus Christ, and leading people astray. I'm sure this is one of the reasons he was ready for the rapture, ready for the future. Uh, Philippians 3.19 says, Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Their end is destruction. Compare this to the Antichrist and false prophet whose end is the lake of fire. The fate of every lost person is going to the white throne judgment and their own self-righteousness and being cast into the lake of fire. The future of Satan is a bottomless pit and then being cast into the lake of fire. These people need to consider their future. Deuteronomy 32.29 says, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. In the Bible, the bad guys lose in the end. Not only is their end destruction, but their God is their belly. Catholic priests eat a wafer that is supposedly turned into God, and they put this in their belly. They are pretending to be cannibals, basically. So their God is their belly, you see. Most false prophets, gods, their false gods are their bellies, because they love money, and they use that money to feed their faces and fleshly desires. It also says whose glory is in their shame. 
Jude one thirteen says, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. They glory in things they should be ashamed of. And Paul says in Romans, What fruit have ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? A good sign you're saved is that you're ashamed of the wicked things you do. You don't glory in them. Next it says, these enemies of the cross mind earthly things. So they definitely aren't reaching forward to the future. They don't care. They're all about right now in this present time, fulfilling the lusts of their flesh. And why would they care about reaching forward to the future? They're lost, and their future is hell. 1 John 2.15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. We don't want to be friends with this world because Paul calls it a present evil world in Galatians 1.4. And the next reason to look forward is because we will soon be with the Savior. Philippians 3.20 says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 13.12 For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. At the rapture we will see... Jesus Christ face to face. Verse 20 says our conversation is in heaven. That is because our affection is set on things above. Paul is looking forward to when he will get a sinless glorified body. And that is another reason to look forward. Because we will have no more pain, sickness, or death. Philippians 3.21 says who shall change our vile body. That it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. First John 3, 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Job chapter 2 gives a good description of us coming back with Jesus Christ in our glorified bodies. If you look at Job 2, 7 through 11, it's obviously talking about us coming back with Jesus Christ in glorified bodies, it says, They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. And our glorified bodies will be able to fall upon swords, and it won't hurt us. They shall run to and fro in the city, they shall run up on the wall. All these comic book characters like Spider-Man that can climb walls that's just a counterfeit of our glorified body they shall climb up on the houses they shall enter in at the windows like a thief we're going to come back with jesus christ as a thief in the night the air shall quake before them the heavens shall tremble the sun and the moon shall be dark and the stars shall withdraw their shining and the lord shall utter his voice before his army okay if this is the demonic locus of revelation chapter 9 it's not the Lord's army. This is the Lord's army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executeth his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? How can you say this isn't us coming back with Jesus Christ? Unless you're trying to deceive and teach something that isn't true. We have eternal life, and our glorified bodies will show our eternal life in a physical sense. There will most likely be bloodless bodies, just like how the Lord Jesus Christ had a bloodless body after his resurrection. If you look at Luke 24, 39, it says, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as ye see me have. Notice he didn't say flesh and blood. In his glorified body, Jesus Christ also had the power to appear and disappear Anytime he wanted. Luke 24, 31 says, And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Referring to Jesus after his resurrection in his glorified body. And Luke 24, 42, he ate food in his glorified body. And I doubt he had to dispose of the food later. And in John 20, 26, Jesus Christ walked through a closed door. Our glorified bodies will be better than we can imagine. 
and the superheroes and cartoon characters are all counterfeits of our glorified bodies. But if you want a glorified body and don't want to end up with a body like your father, the devil, that is, you are a child of the devil if you're unsaved. You're not a child of God. If you want a glorified body like the Lord Jesus Christ, then you should believe the gospel. This is how you get saved and go to heaven and get a glorified body at the rapture. In 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel is, Jesus died, he died for you, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. How did he die? Colossians 1.14 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He died by shedding his blood. The reason he had to die is because you're a sinner. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You need a Savior because you are a sinner. If you want to be saved, believe the gospel. Rely on what Jesus did to pay your sin debt. Realize your own self-righteous works can't get you to heaven. Your good deeds are no good. Our righteousness is filthy rags in the sight of God. And Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You're not saved by quitting your sins. You're saved by turning to Jesus Christ. Forgetting about your own self-righteousness. Turn to Jesus Christ. And when you do this, you believe the gospel. And God gives you Jesus Christ's perfect, spotless, sinless record. And takes away your sinful record. That way, when Jesus Christ sees you, he don't see you no more. He sees Jesus Christ, the per perfect record of Jesus Christ. And that's why you get to go to heaven. So if you want to be saved, believe the gospel. If you want to go to hell, reject the gospel.